It's amazing how that bell works. I have a couple of announcements. Am I David here? Should I? Oh, you know what? I was, I was touching that. Thing. Keep your hands off that. Um, maybe if you could just remember those. Most of you know Mary Wolf and Mary Jane Ward. Mary Wolf uh, died after having a bad fall a few weeks ago. And uh, so she died Saturday. And the funeral will be tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at John 23rd. And so if we would just keep Mary Jane and Mary and all the travelers, quite a few members of Mary Jane, Mary's family just showed up. So that's absolutely pleases Mary uh, Jane. And uh, just friends have just come together to help her. So we would just have 30 seconds of silence. They were very rich, part of our community. Um, next week, just one week away, uh, Father Michael, people still call me Father Jordan, but Michael Abdo, the former abbot of uh, Snowmass, is going to be a speaker. Uh, and Jim Reed is going to interview him just to make it kind of informal. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I'll say a little bit about Wilbur tonight, just kind of to set it up. And uh, the other thing I'd like to do is thank the board of directors. Um, there's no way I could have imagined these kinds of programs when I was all by myself here. So we just have a wonderful board of directors, so I'm very grateful. And one of them is called Yolanda, nice name. And she helped me do this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> she teaches in the School of Business, Entrepreneurship. Nice to have someone like that on our board. So thank you, Yolanda. So tonight's talk is Evolution and the Search for an Integral Spirituality. And I never did this before, and I wasn't sure it was smart, but I shared this with a lot of people before, and I got a lot of comments, which complicated my life. <laughs> And so uh, this isn't a defense, but it's sort of, in the light of all of those things, it's a conversation. So it seemed to me I needed to step back and say, what are these themes and how do they fit together? Is this just a jumble of stuff? Or is there really a logic to it this year? So uh, three themes have emerged for me and they're clearer in my mind after all these conversations and our attempts. Uh, evolution is a new creation story the search for an integral spirituality, that's Ken Wilbur, and religious identity in an evolutionary cosmopolitan world. That's my problem. I've been talking about this for a number of years. When you live in this multifarious world that evolutionary and changing, what happens to your religious identity? So that's the third. We're going to deal with that in the spring, and uh, Professor Janine Hill Fletcher has written some, I think, really exciting things on constructing a religious identity in an evolutionary world, in a cosmopolitan world, from a feminist point of view. So she's pretty exciting. She's really happy to come. So, so tonight we'll talk about the first two and how these themes are playing out in contemporary theology and spirituality. And I hope maybe you will see in your lives. Uh, Yolanda, I, I hope to... Uh, Talk for 20 minutes, and five minutes before that, Yolanda's going to stand up like this. Say you only got five minutes left. And then I hope to have 10 minutes of discussion. So I have three parts, as always. So uh, <laughs> I'll talk for 20 minutes, then I'll have a 10 minute discussion, then I'll talk for 20 minutes. And then we'll have a break, and then I'll last. So that's my plan. 25 years ago, uh, Thomas Berry, who's a passionist priest, calls himself not a theologian, but a geologian. He said that we were caught between stories. The old creation stories no longer worked, and we didn't yet have a new story. We were kind of adrift. And when you have a strong story 
He says, you get up in the morning and you know who you are and where you are and what's expected of you and what's to be done. No question, no problems. But when you're caught, when that story is falling apart and you don't have another one, you're caught between stories. So we're still sort of caught, but 30 years later we do have a much stronger new story which is emerging. But we're caught. It seems to me that our contemporary imaginations, even if you're not a scientist, my imagination is heavily shaped by empirical science. It's not something I chose. I got it from osmosis and from some of my friends. Uh, our imaginations have been shaped to a great extent what we know of science, evolution, the new cosmology, and the new physics. On the other hand, our religious language, our religious imagination, our religious symbols, our religious structures were shaped in a pre-modern world, a very different world. You just have to think of the words like consubstantial. You have to be an Aristotelian to understand the word. Transubstantiation. You have to be an Aristotelian to understand transubstantiation. So a lot of our language is anachronistic. Now, not everybody feels that, and that's okay. I'm not imposing, but a lot of people feel it. So we're caught between these worlds. And some people choose one world as opposed to the other. Some people choose science, and there just isn't any place there for religion. Some people choose very traditional religion, and they're not sure what to do with science. But most of us, that conflict maybe is subliminal. I'm speaking of myself. My imagination is shaped by science. I assume that science is correct. But my religious imagery, and when I see pictures of the Annunciation or the Visitation, I mean, the Christian tradition is deep, deep in me. But it was shaped in a very different cosmology. So it remains subliminal. And we don't have a satisfactory way of integrating those two, some of us. So that's what this theme is about. There is a new story emerging which attempts to integrate these two worlds, this new cosmology and the cosmology, the spirituality that we grew up with. And so the writers and the speakers in this series are all dealing with that theme. And the most obvious one, of course, is Richard Rohr, especially the first night when Bob Ludwig spoke here about the themes. Are you hearing me even in the back? Yes. That's wonderful. This is a great speaker. So um, the speakers are all dealing with these themes. And what I'm trying to do is step back and think critically about their use of science and whether or not it replaces our biblical creation stories. So I'd like to begin with evolution. Uh, and then we'll look at the difference between what some people call scientific naturalism and an integral spirituality. Uh, and I, I'm going to be speaking about, you must wonder, well, who am I talking about? Not all theologians, not all spiritual writers, but these are the ones that I've been reading recently. The full list, there's not a full list, but a longer list. We're going to give you a handout tonight, and you're also going to get a copy of these slides. So you don't have to take notes. And just to make it even better, we're going to put it on the website. So that, that way I don't just throw out all these ideas and then hope you can integrate them. <coughs> Thomas Berry wrote a classic called The Dream of the Earth. As I try to read it now, it's, it's dated. Uh, it's 1988. But it's a classic work on if you tell the story of the evolution of the universe, you can understand where it's trying to go, and instead of dominating the earth, and even being stewards of the earth, like a therapist, we try to enter into the earth's dream and facilitate its progress, and especially not kill it. So that's what that book was about. It's absolutely wonderful. And in terms of the story, uh, Brian Swim is a physicist trained in physics, and he's a colleague of uh, Thomas Berry, and he wrote a book, it's the only one I brought tonight. It has a great cover, 
and it's called The Universe Story from the Primordial Flaring Forth to the Ecosaic Age. <laughs> A celebration of the unfolding of the cosmos. So it's a beautiful poetic, starts with the Big Bang and the planets. And most of the story, I mean, humans really, you know, when people try to show you an image, the human part of that story is like the last sentence on the last page. Uh, so, so much for our importance. Uh, I need to make a comment as you look at those books. Um, because of conversations I've had, uh, there are levels of discourse in theology, as in other topics. Um, more popular writings, and I don't say that in a judgmental way, because that's probably what I am, is a popularizer. The French have a nice word for it, whole vulgarisation, a sophisticated uh, vulgar how would you say that in English? So, but anyway, popular writings go to the heart of the matter. They often focus on practice, the how-to of meditation, or other aspects of spirituality. Uh, several people have told me, I only want books that are going to tell me how to do it. I'm not interested in theory. I'm not interested in abstract thought. I'm not interested in theologians. <laughs> just, just tell me how to do it. More scholarly writers and thinkers try to practice critical reflection on the new spiritualities and practices, and critical in this sense doesn't mean negative. I had this conversation with Bishop Stafford. <laughs> critical does not mean negative. It means, for example, that a person may have studied film so well that the New York Times is willing to pay them to explain how and why a particular movie was good or not good. That's called a film critic. Is somebody who loves film, makes it their life study. It's not negative. That's what I mean by critical reflection. The Theologian in Residence program, by its nature, tries to honor both types of discourse. So I know some of you are here tonight wanting to know how to, some of you are here tonight really needing critical reflection. We try to do both as best we can. As they say in French, my old French teacher, I do the best I try. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with, uh, so, can we go back, I'm sorry. Um, it's hard to say who's popular and who's not popular, but in a sense Richard Rohr is writing for the ordinary person. Not a lot of footnotes. Um, Brian Swim, that book is absolutely not. It's poetic, and again, it's not. It's not a critical read. I don't mean it's not good, and it's not critical, but it's not scholarly language. Judy Canado, uh, Elizabeth, Elaine Prevale, those people are writing for a general audience, and it's spirituality. When you get to Elizabeth Johnson and Ilya Delio and uh, Robert Bella and Ken Wilbur, it's much more scholarly and much more critical and much more abstract. But some of us really need that. And uh, I, the way I say it is, I've met so many people in my life who talked to God this morning and had a message for me. And if you disagreed with that person, you were disagreeing with Bob and with, with God. And so I think we need critical reflection. Can't, you know, so anyway, you, have, you know that. You know, I think I need that. So, let's start with evolution as a new creation story. What we're talking about is, and I, I've mentioned this the last time, but uh, when I started talking to people about evolution, they immediately thought of biological evolution. Maybe I do too. But when these spiritual writers are talking about evolution, they're talking about trying to tell the story, the history of evolution, the history of human evolution, or the history of the whole cosmic evolution as we know it from the Big Bang. Uh, they never mention where does the Big Bang come from, although they have some thoughts. Maybe it came out of a black hole. But and maybe the Buddhists were right. So. 
That's what they mean by evolution. It's the history of that process of evolution turned into a story. And it's one story. It's not like the human evolution is over here and cosmic evolution is over here. We used to think that way. But here it's one story. And we're included in that one story. And maybe eventually even God is included in that story from the beginning and at the end. But when you start telling this story, when you start using story, uh, you're getting into big questions of meaning and even ultimate meaning, and you're sort of impinging on religious beliefs and religious questions about the meaning of the whole process, which go beyond the purview of empirical science. That's the question. Uh, a quotation here from Robert Bella. What evolution as a whole means gets us into large issues which almost inevitably become issues of ultimate meaning that overlap with religion. Some scientists have expressed awe at the immense process of evolution extending over billions of years. Whether awe moves us into another realm than science is something we will have to consider later. <laughs> And we'll send a third part. I'm not saying I have the absolute answer. Why do I think evolution is functioning as a creation story? Well, what is a creation story? And I wish we had time to really do these examples well. But creation stories are great myths. They explain where we came from, who we are, and where we are going. So they help you to understand where you fit in the universe. You have a sense of orientation. I'll say, Fort Collins, you know where West is. And that's what a creation story does for you. You know where you are. And one short one, uh, the community that owned belonged to the Sister Charity Leavenworth, they had an all-community gathering on the 4th of July. And they invited all the former members and all the associate members and all the missionary members from Africa and South America. And they all came together. And they've been together for, I don't know, 200 years. And they, we sang songs for the 4th of July, and they told the story of this community, and the people from Peru told their story, and I was the only, I mean, it was, I think I mentioned this probably, uh, 200 people, there were five men. So I know what it's like to be a minority. But I was so welcomed, and everybody was so happy to be together, and they had just wonderful talks and absolutely beautiful music, it was an experience of community. You were living that story and being together, and it was that common experience that made it, it's called communitas. I had an experience of community with those people and that tradition. The Hajj is like that, where Muslims come from all over the world to visit the sites where Muhammad was. And they reenact the various events in the life of Muhammad, and they pray, and they sing, and they march around the holy place, and they tell the story of who Muslims are, and they have an experience of communitas. It shapes an identity for the people who share in that. That's a creation story, ritual. The one we know best is Holy Week. The problem with Holy Week is that liturgy, liturgists that used to tell me when I was very young, every 50 years you need to clean the house and declutter the liturgy. Everybody has a favorite thing they added on, then you have to do it forever. And what's happened with Holy Saturday is that we have millions of things connected with baptism, and we don't have any time to know what it's really about. It is about baptism, but that's only a small part of it. But that has covered everything. But when you think of what we do on the Easter Vigil, we tell the creation stories, we tell the Exodus stories, we tell the prophets' stories, and then we tell the story of Jesus, and we tell the story of the Passion, and then we celebrate, the, it takes all evening, and it should. That is a creation story. When you go through that, you know where you came from, you know where it's going, and you know who you are, and you know what's expected of you. 
That's a creation story for me and from religious studies. So I think, as I read the people in that bibliography I gave you, they are using the idea of evolution and the history, the reconstructed history of evolution from the Big Bang to us as a creation story. Just read Ilya Delio. She was here two years ago, and everybody found her so expansive and so liberating because she said, this is the new cosmology. And the difference is that in the old days, we looked at the world as a finished product. God created it. I, I studied St. Thomas that way. Geology didn't know until about 150 years ago how the mountains erupted. They had a static view. Science did <clears throat> up to 150 years ago. But the big change, according to Barry, is we don't look at the cosmos. We look at cosmogenesis. It's a process of emergence which integrates the past. It doesn't reject it, but integrates and transforms it. That's our experience of cosmos. So uh, I think evolution, the story of evolution, is functioning for these writers, and I think for me, and I don't know about you, I suspect for many of you, that story of evolution is functioning the way the traditional uh, creation stories did. It's telling us where we are, the nature of the world in which we're living. And Teilhard de Chardin liked to say, evolution, humanity is evolution become conscious of itself and therefore responsible for its future. That's a big change. He also thought that in evolution you look to where it's going to understand it. That you don't understand an acorn. You don't understand an oak tree by looking at an acorn. You understand an acorn by seeing an oak tree. So it's a, it's a whole different way of looking. Uh, so I think uh, that this use, as I read, people gave me these books, especially the more popular books, like, uh, what's her name? Cynthia Bourgeau, Judy Canato, all these people, they're using morphogenetic fields intentionality and weird distance, weird action at a distance. They're using all these and turning them into spiritual principles, and I'm sitting there. I wonder, I have to read this with Linda Joyce, and I have to read this with uh, uh, Howard Enormous, who's in Palestine today. But as I say, they complicated my life enormously. So it needs critical thinking, and that's what we're trying to do in this course. So uh, would you like to comment or as for explanations, or complicate my life even further. <laughs> Let's have a few minutes of discussion. Where are we on time? Five minutes. I have no five minutes left? Okay. No, you have five minutes for discussion. Oh, let's take ten minutes if we can. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what I, evolution is a scientific, well, we used to call it a scientific theory about how the world works, things evolve. And I started studying theology and philosophy in 1950, 60 years ago. I do that. So, but even then, the Catholic theology just accepted evolution. They weren't trying to fight it. They had really far out things like saying, well, seven days could be thought of as seven periods of time. Demythologizing. But then Pope uh, Paul II, a few years ago, wrote a page explaining that we probably shouldn't call evolution a theory because it's really a very well established scientific fact accepted by almost all the scientists. So, so, uh, so yes, it's science. But when but that's what people hear. But it's not just science. That's what we're dealing with here. When you start asking questions about what does it all mean, what's it mean? What was that movie? What's it all mean? What's his name? I forgot his name. It's an old movie. Alfie. So what's it all about, Alfie? That's a religious question. <laughs> so when you start asking religious questions, if, if, your job is empirical science, 
it would seem that empirical science is not equipped to ask and sort out ultimate questions of meaning and direction. Does it have a meaning? Does it have a direction? What is that direction? Does it have values and all that sort of thing? I don't mean to impose them, because but, but there is a conflict. And I'm going to explain when I get to Wilbur what the conflict is and what his suggestion is for solving it. But empirical science doesn't ask religious questions. And many people trained in empirical sciences just don't get why other people are asking religious questions. I've spent 25 years at CSU trying to talk religion to people who uh, don't get it. And as much as they see it, they don't want to get it. So any other, that's an important question though. That came up as soon as I started talking to people about this. Some people were talking about physical evolution. I'm talking about the meaning of this wonderful story, this flaring forth of the cosmos, which is poetry. Welcome, yes. is uh, Teilhard de Chardin at the center of all of this? Are there strands? It's of amazing what... Don't go through him? Uh, Ilya Delio, uh, her book, there's a review of her book I read recently, and she's fabulous and very serious, um, and she knows science. But they said, well, she only quotes Théa de Chardin. It's, it's 40, 50 years ago. And then she reverts back to real Catholic language, even though she's trying to create a language which is generic for the whole of the universe. So those are limitations. But someone pointed out in one of my conversations that just because people haven't finished the job doesn't mean they haven't done something really important and helpful. Nobody's finished the job. So, uh, but I am amazed. All of the main things I'm going to talk about here tonight, Teilhard said them. The difference is that science changes every day. I mean, you know, when did humans start? They found a skull last week and they had this anthropologist from the University of Arizona who was just a god, they found this complete skull, which is 1.9 million years old. And he was just like, I mean, the parousia. I mean, he just couldn't believe it. It was such a wonderful thing. So, so and even, to, even I, not being a scientist, I read Thomas Berry 25 years ago, and I read Brian Swim 15 years ago, and they're sciences. Everything's changed. So it's hard to keep up to date. So yes, Théo de Chardin is like a classic. He's still valuable, but I, it is very important to me because of, I still like to read the Bible, and I can't find a lot of people who want to read it with me. But I think when you read classics, you have to feel their distance. I tell my students, when you read the Bible, if you don't feel the distance, you haven't gotten it. It's really a long ways away, 2,000 years. On the other hand, if it's not asking questions and offering solutions that mean nothing to you, you also haven't got it. So a classic is historically and culturally situated and limited, but it's a classic because it's still worth reading and engaging. And so that's what I would say when I said uh, Thomas Berry's book is a classic, he said it in a way that few people had been able to say it, and it's still very moving and very important. And that's what I say about Théodore de Chardin. The problem is, I think we have so absorbed Théodore de Chardin, we don't have to talk about it anymore. Somebody wrote a book called The Silence of St. Thomas Aquinas, and he had Joseph Pinker, and he said some things are so fundamental that he never mentioned them. And for St. Thomas, the goodness of creation was such a profound presupposition, so deep in his belief, different than St. Augustine, that he never had to talk about it. It was the silence of St. Thomas. But, but it's... It's underlying every single thing St. Thomas ever said. The creation is good. How are we doing? Yeah. Now we need to move. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Um, well, I originally, this is David Dean, what an editor he is. I sent out a notice and I changed the title. The original title of this talk was Lessons from Robert Bella. So that's, that's going to be part of what we're doing. Robert Bella is a sociologist that I have great respect for. He wrote a book in the 60s called Civil Religion. In the first year, we had a program in 1976. Second year, I was here. 
uh, we invited Robert Bella to talk about civil religion. I remember showing him around the university. He was a very nice man. And then he wrote a book called Habits of the Heart, which is a great book, sort of critiquing individualism uh, of America. So then he wrote this book, Evolution, uh, Religion and Human Evolution. And Robert Bella traces the evolution of religion from the Paleolithic to the Axial Age. Now that sounds big. Paleolithic, Paleolithic, the Stone Age, when humans developed the ability to use tools and things like that. And they didn't really have a language yet. Uh, so he, he sort of traces, he's got a hundred page of references to anthropologists, sort of trying to reconstruct the evolution of religion in human life. From the earliest human groupings to small villages, to small kingdoms, to nations, to the emergence of four world religions about 500 years before Christ. Uh, so it's a long book. And of course, the first thing is the conservative Christian magazine. They criticized him for not mentioning Christ. Well, he's been 700 pages <laughs> getting up to the axial age. What, what do you expect? <laughs> But a second book, you know you wrote something important, because the second book with 500 pages came out, which was a conference held on the first book. And the scholars produced 500 pages of response. So I think the book's worth reading. Not, I, you know, not unless you have a lot of time. <laughs> used to say about St. Augustine, take your lunch if you're going to read St. Augustine. <laughs> what he is doing is correlating uh, cognitive stages of human development with social conditions and language, religious language. And uh, Bella is looking for evidence that humans evolved in culture, language, and consciousness. Paul and Carl Jaspers, he believes that the emergence of the rational level characterized four great world religions or philosophies in the middle of the 5th century before Christ. Rational thought meant that if people had evolved cognitively enough, they had enough distance from their myth that they could see that it was a myth, and they were able to critique it and revise it and transform it. And he thinks that Lao Tzu and Buddha and the Jewish prophets and Plato and Socrates, they all said they were going to replace Buddha was going to replace Hinduism. Socrates was going to replace philosophy. Uh, but when you study them, you find out it's a transformation. But you can't understand Jesus without Judaism. You, that's later. But you can't understand Plato without understanding the pre-Socratics. And you can't understand Buddhism without understanding Hinduism. They told me when I went to India, no matter what Indians become, they still remain Hindus. You can't get it out of their blood or their genes. So, uh, What characterized that was that people, it's called an axial age because it was a turning point in history. These people were strong enough in their society that they were able to sell a critique of sacred traditions and say they need to be changed and I've got a better one. That's what Buddha did, that's what Plato did, uh, that's what Lao Tzu and others did in China. So it's called an axial age and what characterized it was rational thought. And what I found so exciting about that book by Robert Bella, especially the early chapters where he talked about these three kinds of language, and then again in the conclusion where he talked about rational language, in between is all the research work. But most chapters are really exciting, probably because it follows the course I taught for 24 years, Meaning and Truth in Religion, on the evolution from religious experience to stories to dominant metaphors to models, to rituals, to practice, finally to philosophy and theology. And it's really a circle. But. So mimetic language, just, just to explain those words, axial means a turning point. The, that was the first time that somebody could change a whole culture by critiquing its sacred traditions. Now, the, in the conferences after some people say, well, that, that, that's not the only place that happened. <clears throat> but nonetheless, it, sort of, it did happen there in those four religions. Mimetic is the, the child 
and I love to ask it's, it's sort of uh, gestures. Before you can speak, you, you use gestures and you speak. And animals do that. And I've been watching dogs ever since because one of the examples he gives is, you know, a dog, you keep their hind legs straight and you put their front legs down. They're saying, I want to play. I mean, that's a real language. And it's a powerful language. Dogs have a powerful, and I didn't know that until my wife taught me that. She would ask, she knew what the dog wanted. I just thought he was just causing trouble. <laughs> I mean, she could read his language. Same thing in movies. Women always get the symbols I never do. I'm in the upper right quadrant. So, uh, but, so mythic language, and what he's going to say is that in evolution, nothing is lost. It's sort of like a conservation of energy. Things are transformed. These are the building blocks. So rational language doesn't cancel out mimetic language. And mythic language doesn't cancel out mimetic language. It transforms them. Uh, a great example that I've had recently was the Van Gogh exhibit. And Van Gogh, poor Van Gogh, he starts out up in Holland, Rembrandt, and it's dark, and it's dreary, and you can hardly see it. And they have to clean it up. Then he moves to Paris. Oh, wow. But all the time he's working on brush strokes, how to use a brush. And then he studies color. He knows all about color. And then he moves to Provence. That's the place to go. Wow, Provence. And then he starts doing flowers. It does a landscape. And that landscape it integrated and used all those techniques that he spent a lifetime, all his knowledge of color, all his knowledge of brush strokes, all his experience of the outdoors. It all comes together in this magnificent landscape at the end of the, of the uh, exhibition. That's, what, that's the way these people are seeing evolution. It doesn't cancel out the past. It transforms and integrates the past. Now, that has a lot to do with religion. Uh, so, mimetic language is gestures. And you can find gestures all over the place. We give hugs down here. You smile. Touch people on the arm. Your eyes light up. That's all mimetic language. Mythic language is narrative. It's a story. And myth, I, you know, for years I didn't like myth because people are still writing papers and articles almost every day in the paper, 10 myths and 10 facts. You know, you got facts, and you got myths. You got the real world, and you got falsity. That's what myth means. But the longer I, I spent 24 years now in religious studies, and myth has become a very important and a very rich and powerful word, and it means story. And I remember we used to read the uh, Imitation of Christ every day at lunch. Heavy and he said, don't snicker when the elders tell stories, for they are not told without reason. <laughs> but story can be really true. Why do we cry at movies and in novels? Why do we get excited? I mean, there's huge truth in metaphor. I spent half my course on meaning and truth in religion trying to get people to understand metaphor. Metaphor. It's not literal, but it's profoundly true. It's not less than literal language. It's so much more. Literal language is language, language in its infancy. Metaphor is, is really mature language. It's older. So mythic is very important, but it's narratives and creation stories. And then you have rational thought, which is where you can step back a myth is transparent. When you're living in a myth, you don't know that you're living in a myth. And I think you find out that you're living in a myth when you encounter other people, when you encounter other religions. Some people like Eliana said, you don't really understand your own religious identity until you encounter something that's really different. Then you know, oh, I guess I have a story and she has a story, and there are two different stories. What are we going to do about that? That's when the myth is no longer transparent. You step back and you have is that my telephone? Nobody ever calls me. <laughs> so that's what rational does. I had an experience. My best religious experiences seem to be at funerals. I don't know why it happens to one. But I guess I won't mention the person's name. But it was at John 23rd. 
this was an ordinary person who never thought she was important. She had a lot of suffering in her life. Uh, never thought she was that important. She never did, I'm sure. Um, it just happened that the church was filled for her funeral. Filled. And it just happened that the gospel was the Beatitudes. I'm sitting there thinking, boy, what a perfect reading. Blessed are those who know they are poor. Blessed are those who suffer. And then the musicians uh, played some music. Uh, we sang a song with all the verses of the Beatitudes. And it was just, oh, I mean, the Beatitudes sum up her life. This, this song just sums up the Beatitudes. But, I mean, it allows you to stay with the Beatitudes while you're singing. And then they do a little interlude where they uh, just sort of interpret the, the words. Just playing music, no words anymore. Just music. Oh, it's even better. We're getting into that language, right? And then they had this young woman who was playing a cello. And the music just comes to a point, and it stops, and there's one note from the cello, which summed up the music, which summed up the words, which summed up the life, which summed up the universe, and the role of Jesus in it. Now there's that's what I call a mystical experience, or a religious experience. Right? See, it is mimetic. I mean, rational language just can't do it all. But for sure, rational language doesn't cancel out. That's really, that's really what Bella is stressing. And they accuse them of being a liberal Protestant and of being a, a religious studies person. First things did. Those are two bad things. <laughs> and uh, he said, first of all, I'm not a liberal Protestant. I've been working with Jesuits at Berkeley all my life. <laughs> So I've been really tainted by them. <laughs> so I go to the Episcopal Church because they understand ritual. So, so that's so that it went through those stages, but it doesn't cancel out and trash the earlier stages. It integrates them. So if you just have rational without understanding, so in other words, rational doesn't replace the method. So what Bella is saying then is that in the evolutionary process, new capacities, new symbols, new rituals, new practices, and new organizational structures emerge to deal with the increasingly complex human situations. He shows how when there was a division of labor, uh, or then when there was foraging, and anthropologists all know this, he just, you know, uh, that changes your worldview, it changes your language, they co-evolve. So these things co-evolve. Your cognitive development, the nature of your religion, and it and it has to do with the social I guess, has to do with the social situation in which you're living. If you have, it's one thing to have a small village of 25 people, and the death average death is at 22. Uh, what does it mean to be religious there? And then you have little kingdoms. And in the tribal villages, the people sang the gods into presence. But then when you had a king and a priest, the king and the priest did it for them, and they became observers. Well, then the king and the priest became the divine. I think I said this the last time. But then you have a bad king, maybe, or a bad priest. Well, then God must be bigger than the king. God must be bigger than him. So it evolves. And so they're always showing this co-relation or co-evolution of the brain and of language. And some of the people, language is like a technology. Language and myth and story allow you to remember a whole lot of stuff that the brain couldn't file all by itself. But if you turn it into a myth, you turn it into a story. So it, it's sort of a technology which leverages the brains. So that's how evolution happens. We're talking a lot today about the plasticity of the brain, which is, I don't know, probably not evolution in a strict sense. But. So that's what Bella's book is talking about. And he ends up with the rational, and he does a wonderful job with Plato showing that the rational includes what Wilbur's going to call the mystical. For real philosophers, the rational is the mystical. Uh, for people who aren't, they think they're opposed. But anyway, that's my self-defense. The, the patterns 
the Vela highlights them. And a lot of this Ted de Chardin pointed out. And Wilbur, Wilbur has 20 tenets that every whole on, every evolutionary unit, every whole thing um, has characteristics. And every breakthrough is characterized by increasing complexity, increasing unity or autonomy. The thing wants to survive, and it works towards its own survival. And it's, it's always an increased relationship with the environment. We're talking about successful evolutions, but even successful evolutions can cause a lot of problems and dangers. Uh, but increasing relationship with the environment, they always include while transcending the past achievements. So uh, I think that, for me, that's very important. It's, you know, my project was retrieval, critique, and transformation. And the retrieval part is very important to me. Uh, and increasing levels of consciousness. That's all of these were in TF Chardin and others. But they're looking at patterns so that you can understand what to expect living in an evolutionary world. And somebody like Ilya Delio is taking these patterns and looking at the old creation stories and saying they need a lot of tweaking. They're looking at religious structures and saying they need a lot of tweaking. For example, your Christology. If the world is the Mediterranean and the, the apostles carried the gospel to the end of the world, meaning all the way to Rome for Palestine, and now the world is bigger. And how long ago was it when we thought we were the Milky Way was it? We were inside the Milky Way. Now they're saying there's 100 billion Milky Ways. I mean. You know, pretty soon you're talking big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to tweak our Christology. What do we mean that Christ is the fullness of divine revelation? He's the only revelation of God. You know, all those, all that language has to be redone. Unless you're willing to say science is just a theory, it's probably not good. But the Pope says it's, it's more than a theory. We can't deny the fact it's established by science. The whole body of scientists have established it. What are we going to do with it? So, um, when you answer one question, you raise ten new ones. That's what Leonard Ben always told us. <clears throat> the new story of the universe raises some important questions. Um, one of the most notable is the conflict between scientific naturalism, not science, the scientific naturalism, and a story of the universe which includes a direction, meaning, even spirit. Is there room in your imagination, I'm talking to myself, is there room in your imagination for truth outside of, or in addition to, or beyond scientific method? Can you imagine truth outside of empirical science? If so, what is the nature of that truth? That, to me, that's the, that's the philosophical question. That's what needs critical thinking. Because different people give different answers. I thought that would be a nice place to take a break. <laughs> but first, that's why I used the back end of the question. Uh, we, we have some time for questions? Yes. They don't have to be questions, they can be size or... <laughs> yes? I've always wondered why somebody hasn't come out with a bumper sticker that said, God created evolution. I, I can't. Uh, can we have a mic? Well, uh, <coughs> well, you wish that someone would come out with a bumper sticker that says, God created evolution. God created evolution, a good bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. And I'm jumping ahead, but Ilya Delio says, you know, that nature is, is the first book we have of God that God wrote. And uh, Vatican II, we found out last year, Vatican II said your theology should be a reflection on your experience. And Ilya Delio says, evolution is the home that God has given us. So we're trying to reflect on our home, which seems to be evolutionary. 
Yeah. So the subject matter seems so. Should we? Should we have a? We have a. We need. The subject matter seems so big. So what do you do? You just think about evolution as change, and which part you're going to think about. Uh, what we're trying to do in this course is just say, if you read uh, these books that I showed you on that list. If you read Thomas Berry, if you read Ilya Delio, if you read Judy Canato, if you read, and they're just, just a smidgen. Everybody's writing about this. You'll know what they're doing. They're talking about evolution. They're trying to reconcile this new understanding of the world. And you know, the old understanding of the world was the world is a hierarchy, ordered, and God created it that way. And that whole hierarchical order, that finished system is the image of God. And so St. Augustine and Monica sort of meditated and they rise up through the earth. They rise up to God. But the earth is there. I mean, uh, you know. Whereas what, what we're looking at now is, it's not cosmos, but cosmogenesis. It's an evolving, it's an evolving evolutionary movement which always includes while transcending or transcends while including what it grew out of, because what, those are the building blocks. That's a very different view of the world. And the other thing is, in the old cosmology, the world, in, we're separate from the world. When we said nature, we meant us, not us, but we meant creation. So we became alienated from nature, earth, and woman. And now we're saying we're part of the story. They're not two different stories. We're in the story. And we're responsible, partly. We've already done a lot of damage to it. Can we get with it? Uh, so it's a, it's a, you know, those things aren't that hard. What I'm trying to do is plant seeds. When you start doing reading, you'll understand why people are doing what they're doing. John's going to offer an alternative answer. He's going to get to that in the second part. She's already read this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break and then you can get to the second part. No, go ahead. You want to? No, no, that's not what I want to say. Oh, okay. Okay, let's take a break. <laughs> speakers and writers that we're talking about are dealing in their own way with a religious spirituality which presupposes and includes scientific knowledge. That's, you really got to get that. David Tracy used to say he was totally committed to the ideal of the university and to the church. And uh, that's the way I feel. It's not a question. Uh, if, uh, if the Pope says that this is way beyond the theory, it's established fact, then you deal with it. You know, I'm not uh, here to say, OK. So <laughs> each of, <laughs> why would I want to? So I mean, the argument isn't with science, but there's a conflict. Uh, so each of the writers we're speaking of are dealing in their own way with a religious spirituality which presupposes and includes scientific knowledge. But then asks further questions about the meaning and direction and about the spirit of evolution. Now those are religious questions we think. 
Wilbur's four quadrants are a way of showing us how to overcome the split between what some people call scientific naturalism and spiritual experience, knowledge, and reality. Scientific naturalism, and I'm thinking of the militant atheists writers like Christopher Dawkins and people like that, who insist that there isn't any truth outside of empirical truth. Empirical meaning measurable. That's a big decision right there. What do you mean by empirical? Does my experience count for anything? Uh, if it can't be measured? You say, well, I can measure your emotions, but can you tell me the content with a microscope? So um, let's look at this. Um, he, you can divide a pie in many ways. This is the way Wilbur divides it. He thinks that every holon, the word holon is a word created by Arthur Kiesler, and it means a unit of evolution, it's a whole, but a whole is always part of a bigger thing. So it's called a holon. So every holon has certain characteristics, it has certain dimensions. So the first dimension, and he uses biology only as an example, so we got confused the last little because we had several of these quadrants of using different examples. He uses biology because a lot of us know the basics of biology. So we start with biology, and it sort of, he thinks, it's I, it. So uh, it's the upper right, it's exterior, it's individual, it's behavioral. It's what Howard Narnes does. He teaches the evolution of the central nervous system from one cell to a fully existing human being. That's a semester course. Uh, but it's not about feelings, although he just did a course for Osher, and he talked a lot about how you can manipulate feelings uh, with the plasticity of the brain and the drugs and all that sort of thing. But nonetheless, he's not telling you the content or the meaning of the feelings. You might, you might want to object to this, but this is what Wilbur's saying. So that's uh, so there are four dimensions, and the dimensions are uh, exterior and interior, and individual and collective. So you end up with four ways of dividing it. So after the upper right comes the upper left, and that's intentional. That's what uh, Jim Reed does in therapy. That's what we do in spirituality. When we talk about religious experience, when we talk about the stages of cognitive development, you don't see the stages, I don't think you see the stages of cognitive development with a microscope or with a blood test. Uh, Wilbur says, people have to tell you about their feelings, and then you have to interpret what people are telling you. I always give the example, it's sort of makes the point, this guy is sitting with the psychiatrist, and we said this last time, sitting with the psychiatrist telling the psychiatrist how much he loves his mother. And I love my mother so much I never got married, and uh, I don't even travel, and uh, I don't really have a job because I really love my wife. And the psychiatrist is thinking, boy, this guy really hates his mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to interpret the inner life of somebody. They have to share it with you, and it has to be interpreted. Empirical science, I don't think, teaches you they teach you how to interpret empirical things, but it's, um, I, I think he's making a point, at least, he sort of covers himself, he says, at least phenomenologically, the inner world we experience as different than the outer physical world. We experience them differently. Now the metaphysical question is, are they really two different worlds? That's enough, but he puts that off in the time being. At least we experience the interior is different. So then you have the collective, but it's still individual. And centering prayer, and I think you know, I, and uh, meditation books. It, sometimes they never seem to get out of that upper left quadrant. Uh, okay, the lower right is collective, but it's still it. And I, I think he has the word uh, ecology down there, which is dealing with systems. It's not just dealing with individual things, but ecology is dealing with the whole system and how it has to operate in concert with itself to survive. So, and then the lower left 
is worldviews. That a society has a common worldview, uh, which is different than an individual, but it shapes me as an individual. He gives the example of somebody who goes to sort of buy a loaf of bread, and the upper right quadrant is you analyze how the bread is made and what it's made of. And the upper left is, why are you buying bread? Why don't you, uh, Father, what's his name? Marcel said they, they, they didn't eat bread where he grew up in Africa. They ate leaves of some sort. So he never, he never got to eat bread or potatoes. I, either bread or potatoes. He just, so that's cultural. Um, so they're all involved. So, uh, the other, so there's four quadrants. And what he's saying is if you're locked into one of those aspects of reality, you're missing something. It's a truncated, inadequate view. And you tend to critique the other. If I'm coming out of the upper right quadrant and I watch these people uh, in the upper left, I say, what are they doing? You know, it's, why don't they just do some good abstract rational thinking? Uh, so, so you need all four quadrants. Then if you have the next slide, each one of these quadrants, or these are just examples of what we're putting in here, has a history. So this one we already talked about, and he uses biology because most of us can at least understand the schema. That's Howard's course on the evolution of the central nervous system, maybe. And he specializes in the anatomy of the brain, is what he really specialized in. So uh, that's behavioral, it's exterior, it's scientific, it's measurable, it's objective. Then on the left, uh, but it's an evolution. I mean, his course was called The Evolution of the Central Nervous System. So it's the story of how it evolves. Then in the left, uh, you have uh, human cognitive stages of human development, cognitive development. And that's apprehension, sensation, emotion, and vision logic. I would put that a little differently, but, but what Wilbur means by that is the interior. Uh, of course, they're correlated. So you're getting into the problem of the mind versus the brain. Are they really two different things? Or can the brain be reduced? Can the mind be reduced to the brain? Is there a God gene? Is there a religious experience gene? All these things. Is Are genes your destiny? Uh, is there such a thing as free will? Is there such a thing as meaning? Are myths just fairy tales? Uh, so is there such a thing as the intentional, the interior? Now, phenomenologically, we mean, I can't, can't touch that. <laughs> <laughs> phenomenologically, we know we experience them as different. OK, so then you go down to the lower right. Uh, and that's uh, looking at societies. So that's the communal part of it. We're not just individuals. And that, and each one of these quadrants, then to the left quadrant, we'll move on here. Next one. Uh, so there are planets, families, tribes, agrarian, industrial, there are nations. You can, of course, that can be spread out. These are just examples. And the, that book by Brian Swinman, they do the whole story from the Big Bang. It's just a, a beautiful poetic telling of that story. Now, Robert Bella is doing on the left, and I rearranged this, because what Robert Bella does is uh, mimetic, mythic, and rational. I'm sure the arrows go a little different than mine do, but that's, that's the way he shows it. So tribal religions tended to be use a mimetic language. They probably, he believes, it's been a big argument for the past hundred years, but it seems like it's going towards what Bella is saying. It seems as though symbol and ritual come before myth. And my definition of myth is it's a narrative form of a society's fundamental principles which orientate, orientate and motivate people. So myth is the narrative form of symbols, and symbols come before myth, and ritual comes before a doctrine. Uh, so it all starts with ritual. So his book is using anthropologists to describe the correlation between tribal religion and mimetic language, which is ritual, 
So the first thing that came was dance and music and gestures and symbols, like mimes. Uh, and then in archaic religion, when the society gets bigger and a little more complex, they start telling stories, and stories is sort of putting meaning. You know, John Shea used to say, people keep telling the same story because they can't understand it. And everybody has a story and they're dying to tell it to one a receptive person. And the reason they keep telling that story is they're trying to understand it. And that's why I had to do this thing twice tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So our hand religion tended to use mythic language, and axial religions, he thinks, might characterize the Buddha and uh, Lao Tse, and those people was that they had enough distance from the myth they were living in to critique it and offer a new myth. And they thought they were going to trash the old one. They said that. We're going to all of them start all fresh. But when you study and you see they couldn't, and you take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Take the boy out of the monastery, but you can't take the monastery out of the boy. Um, so uh, that's what Bella's doing. And Bella is interested in religion, and he's very interested that you don't trash the past, but that you integrate and transform the past. That's what he's about. Ken Wilbur is, is working up here. He's interested in cognitive development. And whereas Bella talks about rational and shows how mystical it can be, Bella says there's a level beyond rational, which he calls mystical. <coughs> I think if you understood rational, you'd just stay with rational. But anyway, uh, that's, that's how this works. So, um, let me just talk about this quadrant. When Wilbur recounts the story of human evolution, he moves toward levels of consciousness beyond the rational to the experience of spirit, which manifests itself more and more as human consciousness evolves. Uh, he moves toward levels of consciousness beyond rational to the experience of spirit, which manifests itself more and more as human consciousness evolves. There's a word in theology now called panentheism, which means that not pantheism, God is in all things, but God is coming to be in all things. All of creation is God's self-expression. So God, N N, God is in all things, and God is coming to be more and more in all things. And Ronner redid Christology by saying, the creation is God's image, and the human is a, is a more integral image of God. And Jesus is such a perfect image of God that we call him God. I mean, some people might call the Buddha that too. So, you see how different, you see where we're going with that? So the spirit, these people think there's a spirit in evolution. Now they're asking religious questions. It seems as though we're beyond the empirical. Uh, Spirit becomes more and more conscious and manifest in a mystical experience when one realizes that one is in the story. One is part of the story. The spirit is manifested in you and in your creations. So it's not nature out there and me over here. I'm part of that story. I'm in that story. Uh, yourself is a manifestation of the spirit. The whole world is moving towards fuller expression of the spirit. So the spirit's there, but it's not fully expressed. It keeps getting more and more expressed as the earth evolves. Now that's what a lot of people are saying. That's what Tehar was saying. I think that's what Whitehead was saying. Um, read Elizabeth Johnson on the Holy Spirit. Remember the she who is that book on the Holy Spirit? Uh, Elaine Prevole, who is the sister of Loretto, called, wrote a book called Baking the Ship. They're excellent examples of Catholic theologians appropriating the East's understanding of imminence as well as transcendence. So God isn't just, God in the end, God. God isn't just what we're coming to, or the Spirit. But the Spirit is what's behind it also. So the Spirit is there all the way through creation. And so cosmogenesis isn't just evolution, but it's evolution understood as being rooted in what went before. And that's Teilhard de Chardin. Now, whether you can buy that or not is another question. The spirit is the mover of our spirit and of the cosmos, of our consciousness. That consciousness, for Wilbur, 
exemplified, uh, characterizes the upper levels of the world's great religious traditions. So the consciousness of spirit and your part in that spirit is characteristic of the mystical traditions in the very world religions, according to Wilbur. Uh, at this point, we are really talking about the relationship between science and religion. What would our science look like if it integrated religion, or if the scientist <coughs> integrated religion in her worldview? And what would our religion look like if it integrated evolution in its worldview? Religion is an interpretation of our experience, our current experiences of an evolutionary cosmopolitan world. Evolution is the home God has given us. Evolution is the home God has given us, and we're just reflecting on that. That's what this is about. In this story, the spirit is the mover, I'm repeating, the mover, the animator of our spirit, the consciousness of our consciousness. It is this consciousness which characterizes the higher levels of the world religion. So, you, you see what I'm saying? Let's just stop there for a minute and see if I... And I realize this, this is a conflict, in, I think, in all of us. I, it's in me. I think my imagination is shaped as much as any scientist is by the empirical method. So it's, it's a, I think it's a real question. Is there room in your imagination for truth that's not empirical in the sense of measurable? Because religious people like William James and others would say there's such a thing as religious experience. It's real experience. But if you start out denying, and that, what is scientific naturalism? Scientific naturalism are people who argue that there is no world outside this world. There isn't any. And if you're having visions or if you're having religious experiences, that just can't be. That's the conflict. It's not between science and religion. It's between what's called humanistic scientific naturalism. It has a name. And Christopher Dawkins or Tim Hitchens or those are the kinds of people who are developing that. And they're developing it, but I, I, I think it's subliminal in all of us, because all of us have this scientific imagination. Whether we're scientists or not, that's what we've grown up with since elementary school. So that's what the conflict is. Um, now, let me just say one last thing, and then I'll try to get you to comment. Um, Elizabeth Johnson in her book on uh, She Who Is, said, you know, traditionally we looked at the Trinity, we started with God the Father, and then we moved to God the Son, male, God the Son, male, and then we're supposed to move to the Holy Spirit, but we take a detour and start about church, which is also male and patriarchal, and we never got around to the Holy Spirit. So she's suggesting a change. Why don't you start with the experiences of spirit, which is really open to everybody, it's really an ecumenical global term, understand spirit and talk about experiences of spirit then you might see Jesus as the human face of that spirit uh, uh, this Sophia Rizzo who wrote a book called Child of Sophia Jesus is a child Sophia happens to be a lot of feminine imagery in the Bible on Sophia so Jesus is the human face of that spirit and then what we call God the Father is the only racing mystery out of which to which this spirit this movement of emergence is going. So when I pray, I try to think of experiences of spirit. I try to think of stories from life of Jesus, which sort of, there's a, a great line in uh, theologians, it's, uh, I think I mentioned this the last time too, but it's important. The angel was taking Jacob to find a wife or something like that, and he told him we're going to see God on this journey. And halfway through, he says to the angel, you said we're going to see God, but you're just, you're just showing me examples of bravery and kindness, stuff like that. So the angel says, well, what do you think God would look like if he walked the earth among us? So that's the way Christians see Jesus. That's the way we see him. Uh, so, um, and then God is the, the mystery. So that's, that's what Wilbur, I think that's why Wilbur is so interested in mysticism. And people say... He's a philosopher. Is he interested in religion? Where's God? Where's Jesus? Well, he is opening up a space for God. He thinks that philosophy opens up a space for God in our imaginations. 
But he says we should be very careful as to how we fill that space. <laughs> the reason Jim and I got so excited over Wilbur all summer was that on every page, he made really important distinctions that helped us, that we felt needed to be made. I, is this part on Wilbur? Do you understand what Wilbur's doing, first of all, before you agree with him, or disagree? Okay, no? No. So, Joe, am I looking at this, and uh, sort of I want to sort of check with all of the ways I Yes. Yes. I thought you were going to ask a different question. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's my understanding of what he's doing. But, you know, you use the word science, and I'm trying to think of sort of... Well, well, I should say, I should always say empirical science. Well, not, uh, and let's tease that out a little bit more. How do people see science every day? You know, they see science as um, sort of empirical science, and they see it as That's right. So, you know, what, the, what, what science, just one word, has done to increase our understanding of processes in the physical world, through the human evolution and the ecosystem evolution, through our understanding about how then families can be uh, dysfunctional or functional. Now you're into anthropology, sociology, right. psychology. Right. So They're all sciences in a sense. They are all sciences. Yes. So I'm trying to flesh that out. That yes. That's what he's saying, and I think good scientists do that. Good scientists don't just stay in the empirical questions. They move over into the other. But I think the people who are defending scientific naturalism are saying, no, you don't do that. Right, that's one. That's just one. Yes, that's right. But that's not scientists. That's empirical naturalism. Well, Pardon? Pardon? Yes. Well, he's a scientist, but I mean, it's not all of science. I think it's what you're saying. Right. That's what I'm saying. But I'm also saying that a person who's not a scientist sitting in this room, for example, would look at this and say they have some interaction with what science has done to increase our understanding. And, and the question is, how does that understanding enhance our spirituality? Isn't that, I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do? Yes, exactly. He's trying to get you to move, move up here. And there's, people have trouble with stages and levels. But the way he defends stages and levels is that a, a new integration incorporates more things. It integrates more things. It's a more effective, more economical way of dealing with a more complicated society. So in that sense, it's levels and stages. It doesn't mean you're better. But, it, but it, it, it only, it's hard not to say stages and levels, because it does seem to evolve. And he's trying to, and he's saying each one of these is an evolutionary history. And in terms of human development, lots of things can go wrong. He thinks most people are going to need some kind of therapy because if you skip stages or you don't deal well with certain stages, it's like that you've got a crutch. And so therapy sort of helps you identify those crutches and deal with them. So yes, he's trying to move you up there. That's why he's really interested in mysticism and theology. I thought that I, I, I don't want to give you problems. But I thought the problem would come up between mind and brain. Because that really irritates me when people are always trying to say, anything the brain can do, we can find it. Anything the mind can do, we can uh, And But the truth of it is that these co-evolve. I mean, we need the brain. We can't do any of this over here without the brain. 
and you can see different different things are done in different parts of the brain, and we, the brain is flexible and uh, pla uh, pla plastic, so we can change the brain for better and for worse. So, uh, just let me throw this out when I think of it. Anyway, I don't want to stop the other question. So that uh, one way of looking at this, you could say, well, you've got the spiritual world and you've got the physical world, and uh, there are two worlds. Or you could say, these are aspects, a holon, every holon has those four aspects. It's the nature of a holon. It's the nature of things. As an inner and an outer, as an individual and a collective. So they're not two different worlds. So instead of portraying it like this, you could portray it, and I think Rosemary Ruther sort of suggests this, she's probably not the only one, that in human evolution, you evolve this brain, and the brain just keeps evolving into consciousness. So it is a new and different level beyond the empirical. But it doesn't have to be a parallel world. It could just be the, you see what I'm saying? It's another way, of, probably doesn't solve it, but it's a creative way of thinking about mind as a further evolution of the brain. I like it. Pardon? We have another slide. I forgot. <laughs> the patterns in evolution that Bella highlights give us clues to what characterizes successful evolutionary breakthroughs, as well as the challenges and dangers that they involve. I said that. I think we need to, I was going to, that's what we're talking about. These characteristics. I was just, we just I'm going to show this slide twice. Because my commentary, it also is on this. Those are patterns. And I guess the question is, do those, does that make sense in terms of your experience of life mm -hmm. and your reading and your experience as a scientist or as a human being? Those, do you see those patterns in your own growth, your own history? Does that help you understand yourself and your church and your religious tradition and the university and other institutions? Or have I lost you? Yes. John, before I launch into the integral cosmology, I have a real basic question. One is, why do we need a creation story? And two is, who is the keeper of that story? Good question. I need creation stories. I have to go back to my basic image. When I'm in Fort Collins, I know where east, north, south, and west is. When I go to New Orleans, I don't have a clue because everything's upriver or downriver and the river meanders. And there's no way of knowing what direction you're going unless you live there for 20 years. So without a creation story, I need to know, I mean, maybe some people don't have any questions, but we need to know where we came from and where we're going, I think. I, I, so uh, who's in charge of them? Mm -hmm. Well, um, What happens with stages of, a lot of this is based on the image of cognitive, stages of cognitive development. And in stages of cognitive development, you have to have cognitive dissonance. You have to become unsatisfied. As we grow up, we learn to cope with the world. But then the world gets more complicated, and the way we cope with the world doesn't work so well. It's called cognitive dissonance. And then somebody comes along with a better way of doing it. Just one stage about where I am. And I said, oh, let's do it that way. Let's not touch the thing up here. So a creation story in religion sort of encourages people to ask ultimate questions and to think about them. Because that gives people, I mean, if you have a good creation story, you can die for your country. You can, you can not only die for things, you can live for things. It seems to me we need a story. But sometimes stories then, I think, people who are in charge of organizations, the last thing they want you to do is tamper with the stories. That's going to screw everything up for them. So they're the keeper of the story until people rebel enough that uh, you hope it's not a bloody revolution. If they're smart, they'll, they'll let you change the story before you have to have a bloody revolution. But am I, you see what I'm saying? I do. I think that's what religion, Religion is interested in the whole, the meaning of the whole. Where are we? Where are we from? Where are we going? In 
different religions, I mean Buddhism, I think they're all doing that, but they have different ways of expressing that. Ask another question, Suzanne. Follow uh, up. Bruce? Yeah. Well, uh, I may not have answered your question, but it's best I can do. It seems to me that earlier you made reference to a conflicting creation story between you and Archbishop Stafford, or maybe just Bishop Stafford. Uh, two different stories all together. And um, the problem with that is that historically other people have always controlled our creation story. Each of us in uh, this room... Can you get my microphone? I can't That's all right. Oh, I'm well, sorry. I want to hear it. You want to hear it? <laughs> Thank you, Togo. <laughs> Each of us in this room has a creation story. And some of us have been fighting our whole lives to have our creation story understood by the old white males who have dominated and controlled the creation story. And uh, so I think the question is very apt. Yeah. And the original point was that perhaps you and Archbishop, pardon me, Bishop Stafford had a different creation story and a different notion of who should control that. I think the genius of your talk is that it opens more clearly for all of us the repertoire that each of us has in building our creation story. I like that. I'm a little bothered if you're saying each of us has an individual creation story. That's probably true. But I think creation stories are usually a cultural... That cultures have creation stories. Yes. And you can be willingly or unconsciously shaped by that and then uh, I think you, you could make an argument, maybe that's your argument, as you grow in cognitive development, you become more and more independent of that unconscious <coughs> creation story, and you begin to reshape it under your experience, like women have done in the past 50 years with regard to our creation stories. Well, more conscious of how the creation story violates your own integrity. Yes, but I hear it. I hear a real individualism coming from you, which surprises me. Um, You're a social worker. It, it's my, <laughs> my intention is not to preach individualism, but just to open up the options. You should microphone. I'm sorry. My intention is not to uh, promote individualism, but simply to um, value the options that people have. Uh, you have, have exposed us to the uh, story of Ken Wilber. But each of us, if we had a publisher, could have the same voice that Ken, Ken Wilber has, and probably has lots of pieces of, of our own story that would not match Ken Wilber's, but you know, might cross here and there. And so I'm simply saying that um, Personally, I'm interested in stories here. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I'll ask that question. Would you put the last slide up while she's talking? Let me, let me make a comment, too, uh, about that. I think, uh, I think wait, Bruce is... Talk. Thank you. Yeah. Where? Right here. <laughs> I, I think what Bruce is pointing out is we all live out of a personal narrative. We all what? We all live out of a personal narrative. Right. We all have a personal story we're living out. Yes. And that story is embedded in, in various community and cultural narratives. Right. And I think that's, so it's, it, there's sort of a nesting, which is one of the things Wilbur's language uses a lot. These things are nested inside of other things. Yes. But we all have that bigger context is, are the bigger community stories, but we all also have a personal narrative. And I see that as a, as a therapist every day, and other people who are therapists run into that too, that people are acting out and living out a personal narrative through their whole life, basically. And it can be modified, obviously. Yeah. Let me ask you and Francis a question. Sometimes people have criticized psychiatry and the therapeutic culture as helping people adjust to a bad society. Sure. And helping people live well in a bad creation story. Right. So do you, in therapy, do you get to encourage people to critique the culture? Yeah, I'm going to let Francis answer that too. That's, that's, that's actually one of the things that Wilbur addresses because we live in cultures where the narrative is at a certain developmental level. 
And as you continue to evolve, that dissonance with, with the common narrative gets bigger. Okay. And you either continue to uh, honor the dissonance and individuate, and it is the process of individuation, and the integration to another higher story, or you regress back to a lower level. So I, it, you know, there are all kinds of styles and schools of therapy, but obviously, uh, but that process is always going on. So our culture is either pushing us forward in development or causing us to regress. All these institutions are constantly doing that. And so it's really important the community you, you choose to live with, because that community is either supporting that development or keeping you stuck, basically. That's that's very, I mean, Francis has some things. That's very good. Thank you, John. <laughs> well, I know the answer from Francis because of his life, so. Uh, just quickly, there's another question, and then, uh, Helen, and then, then we'll just look at the conclusion here. Uh, I was only... Uh, All right, comment. I, I was just going to comment about the, the idea of a creation story being individual, and I think that there is obviously a lot of truth to that, that we all have an individual version of that creation story, but it seems to me that those do come together. If you think about uh, the whole on being the community that we belong to, then as my creation story changes or uh, evolves, uh, I'm in community always with my family, the people here, all the groups that I belong to, so it it not, is not only an individual no. creation story. In this, no more than a cell is only a cell. I am, I am. You're a whole lot. I am, I, and this is, I, and so I am affecting, all, all, and not just me, but all of us are affecting the the cultural creation story. I mean. We may feel like it's not happening quickly enough, or we are. We do feel isolated or um, alienated from a large part of what culture is telling us. On the one hand, on the other hand, when you do find the like-minded communities, then you do have that ability to call that creation story more fully into being. I think. Thank you for that. That's that's really what Dream Tenado is trying to say. I think he said it. That's what she's trying to say in that book. Uh, uh, let me just look at. First of all, I'd like to say that after all this critical thought, I've decided that these people are doing a really good thing, trying to uh, use. I think it's a good movement. Although, as somebody said, uh, Linda, I think uh, you don't have to reject a book just because she didn't finish the job. That's right. You know, she did a good job, so it's not finished. Good. Uh, John Shea told me once that people criticized his third chapter, and he said, that was wonderful, because that was my next book. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about a spirituality for the second half of life. I think Jim could address this next week. He thinks maybe the theologian residence program has or could have an inch. We can't talk to everybody, but certainly this course is sort of not addressed. It's, it's addressed in the second half. doesn't mean at 35 you're in the second half. It's a conversion when you start asking new questions on a deeper level. It's a process of spirituality. If, if this is right, if what these people are doing is right, then we need a process of spirituality, not a static spirituality. People, uh, I know this, people want a spirituality which teaches a method. Harvey Cox told me once, 30 years ago, the trouble with Christianity is, we don't have a method of meditation. That's why people are turning east. That was before centering prayer. Um, but people want a method, and they need a method. Um, it, it needs to be inclusive, not parochial. We'll come to that later. Uh, we also live in a cosmopolitan, globalized world. Uh, it, it shouldn't, and this is, it should not be individualistic. It can't be limited to the upper left quadrant. That's not the only home for spirituality. It co-evolves with the other three quadrants. Um, Non-dualistic. Bob Ludwig did such a nice job the first night explaining this from Richard Rohr. Uh, there's not one world for God in one. We meet God in our relationships. Carl Honor wrote a life-changing article for me 
in volume three, it was 23 volumes of collected essays um, between a horizontal and vertical spirituality. A lot of people don't like it, but he said, most of us don't need God on the mountaintop. Whether we're believers or not, we are involved with God in our relationships. And the way we deal with our relationships, we really know it or not, like it or not, we are dealing with God in those relationships. That's where it happens. Um, that's what I mean by non-dualistic. So your job should be promoting the evolution of the world. Non-dualistic, not to us, where we need God in this world, especially in our relationships. A spirituality, now here's where it gets Christian. Here's, but I think uh, this line is what Wilbur is saying. It, it, it needs to be a spirituality, religion, language capable of including, well this is Bella, the mimetic, the mythic, the rational, and the mystic. We need all of those, so we need ritual, we need stories, we need myths. A spirituality open, here's me from Elizabeth Johnson, a spirituality open to the holy mystery as imminent, incarnate, and transcendent. We experience God as spirit, we experience God as human in Jesus, and we experience God as the mystery who is more unknown than known, but about whom we have clues in the life of Jesus. So that's the kind of spirituality I think it leads to that you probably could add a whole lot of things to that. But that sort of sums up uh, for me, Bella and Wilbur. Are you worn out? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay. We have a handout. In case you want to really study this, we have a bibliography and this, all the slides. And a full bibliography, sort of. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>